Okay, I'm probably going to kill the uh, the audio there and uh, start out uh, talking about what we'll talk about. So, what's the the relevance of, of that with what we've talked about so far? We've uh, pressure. It is pressure. It's pressure, but it's also differences in pressure in the location. We haven't talked about buoyancy yet, but buoyancy relies on the fact that if you take an object in air or it, perhaps it's easier to think of it in water. Take a, a canister in water, and it's filled with water, and water's all around it. We know that the pressure on the bottom of that is slightly larger than the pressure on the top, but if it's filled with water, the weight of that water inside it directly balances that pressure imbalance. If you take the water out of the canister and replace it with something less dense, then the weight pushing down on it no longer is in balance, and there's an out-of-balance force pushing up. And that basically is the essence of, of buoyancy that we've talked about. And so I'll kill that. Whoops, I'm not sure where that's gone. I'll kill it so we don't have to look at it. And I guess. So that's the essence of what we've been talking about so far. So that's the, the rationale for, for being able to, to look at what we just looked at. Um, and so the, the one point I'll make is that Sometimes we go off-grid, and so off-grid from last time, uh, I don't know if you looked through the notes from last time, off-grid from last time was a derivation that's the same derivation that's in your book if you've bought it, uh, but I think it was a little bit more compact, and we got to where we needed to get to, and so um, rather than go through these pages and pages of derivations, we did it much more uh, efficiently, I think, by first of all, invoking this idea that you can stack cans, and that would give you the change in pressure that changes as a function of depth, which gave us this expression here exactly. And um, this is all, and the ultimate um, expression that we developed was this, which we stated in a slightly different way. And if you remember the way we stated it, it was something like in the z-direction, we had an equilibrium equation, which was something like a rate of change of pressure with elevation minus a unit weight minus a density and acceleration in the z-direction is equal to zero. Acceleration would be if this bucket of fluid was moving, accelerating, but if it's not accelerating, then we can get rid of this term here. And if that's the case, then this expression exactly gave us this. 
You remember that we had, <clears throat> by resolving these buckets in the x, y, and z direction, happened to be a cubical bucket, but it was a bucket nonetheless, for the forces in those different directions, we ended up with an expression in the uh, y direction, which if you remember was just the same as this, but as a function of y. There's no gravity acting in the y direction, and it would be with this term here. And likewise for x, I might as well uh, write them all out. Again, no gravity acting in this direction, and density times acceleration in the x direction. If we want to write this in a compact way that's a little bit like is written in the book, then the closest to that is this. These terms here are these. Oops. This term here is this. This is in the z direction. So this equation here is the equation in the z direction. This equation here is in the y direction. And this equation here is in the x direction. I know I'm scrolling over this, but I'm just trying to make the point that the compact way of writing this, this is exactly what we derived last time. For now, we're not going to worry about any of these last components. We also, I guess, made the case that this expression was equal to F minus M A equals zero. And so it really is nothing other than applying Newton's second law. It happens to be written in terms of derivatives, but it's Newton's second law nonetheless. And in the cases where we throw away all of these acceleration terms, we're left with really only two relationships that we, three relationships that we need now, two of which we've proven, and one which I'll ask you just to take on trust. The two which we've proven is, first of all, this. I'm going to take, get rid of this. Does it do it? Oh, no, wrong one. The first is this, that pressure changes as a function of depth. There's a negative sign in here because our sign convention is that as we go upwards, z is positive. And so what we are saying before earlier about buoyancy is if you think of your can of fluid that sits like this and you draw pressure as a function of depth, then it changes with depth. And so this would be a larger pressure here acting on the bottom and say zero pressure on the top. And this is directly balanced by the weight of this, if it's the same fluid. That's the reason why pressure changes with depth is because you're carrying this weight of stuff above your head that you feel in your ears in the swimming pool. If you take this pressure away, by removing the fluid and replacing it with a less dense fluid, for instance, where the weight is equal to the volume times the density times gravity, right? If you replace it with a less dense fluid, then all of a sudden now, W is less. P stays the same because the fluid is all around this can, and it pops it up, just like a bubble rising in, in uh, liquid. And it's the same as a balloon going up in the air, which is with the relevance of what we just, just looked at. And so if you zoom out from the differential components, where this is our little differential cube, and think of it as a, a bucket or a can, then it perhaps is easier to deal with. So this is one fundamental relationship that we derive, which is really what it says that pressure increases in some way with depth. The other one that comes out of these second two equations is that the pressure as you go horizontally is the same if you don't leave the, the fluid. And so one manifestation of that, I guess, uh, if you want a kind of a practical example, is the idea of a storm surge. And so the idea of a storm surge, and you can you could check, here's the hypothesis. You could say that the, the water level, as you go maybe a couple of hundred kilometers across a hurricane, does this come up on the board, or is it cut off? 
Yeah, it's still there. So hurricanes uh, usually are intense low pressures. Um, if you look at the pressure in a hurricane, then normal pressure, normal atmospheric pressure is what? Roughly. I put it on the, my, the, my browser, but I won't look at it. A typical low pressure in a hurricane is probably something like 900 millibars. This is 1,000 uh, millibars, one atmosphere. So a typical pressure might be of the order of 90 kPa. And so the manifestation of this expression here is that if this is x and y horizontally, and this is z vertically, it means you can go from the sea surface here to the location here. By definition, we're in the same fluid, so the pressure here should be 100 kPa at some depth. But the pressure here is less. And so the height rise z is non-zero, it's finite. And so it's going to be equal to the difference between these two pressures. It's going to be, this has to be, uh, the pressure change delta P has to be equal to the unit weight of the fluid, which is water, multiplied by its depth. Unit weight of water is something like 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed. And so that means that if we need 10 kPa, Z has to be something like one meter for this delta P to be equal to this difference is 10 kPa. Pretty sure that's right. So the idea is that the sea level in the middle of a hurricane is something like a meter higher maximum in a really extreme hurricane than it is on the edge. And so that could be one reason for storm surges. It's not completely because it's not enough because storm surges are pr perhaps a few meters. And the reason for that is you get this circulation that's pushing, piling up the water on, on land uh, by uh, acting across the top of the surface, making waves, in other words. And so this is part of the story, but it's actually a small part of the story. So two things that came out of last time. Pressures as you go horizontally in the fluid don't change, which is what this interesting statement is here. And the pressure change as you go up and down changes proportionally to the unit weight. Always absolutely true. The one we didn't um, prove, but you'll take, I'll ask you to take on trust, is that if you look at a fluid pressure acting at a point, the fluid pressure is acting on all directions of the same. And the reason is because the fluid isn't uh, stiff enough or rigid enough to be able to sustain any differential between those pressures. And so those are the three things, if you like, that have come out of our discussion of statics. What we then did with this expression, which we say applies everywhere, is we dealt with it for the case where density is constant or unit weight is constant. And if we did that, what did we do? We took, um, I don't want to rederive it, we took dp is equal to z times dz, and we integrated both sides, and we ended up with an expression that was basically this. The pressure at some point you go down some depth below it, h or z in this particular case. h is a positive number. If you're going downwards, you multiply the depth by the unit weight, and you get the change in pressure, just as we kind of alluded to here. This is a straight line relationship. Density is constant, and so this is a linear change in pressure as you go down with depth, negative z. The other case that we dealt with was where the unit weight was not constant, so I guess not constant. And all we did was we used the fact that we know that pressure is equal to density times gas constant times temperature. We rearranged that as density is equal to pressure divided by RT. And if we wanted to, we could also write this as density is equal to pressure times mass okay, divided by universal gas constant, R over bar, times T. 
and we substituted it uh, into this is unit weight, right? Get rid of this. This is unit weight, and it's a negative sign here. So we substituted this is equal to density times g. We substituted this into here, and we did the integration, and we came up with a more complicated expression, included logs. But it allowed us to be able to calculate the fact that as you go up in the atmosphere, pressure changes not linearly, but nonlinearly. And the reason I write this as this is that uh, you'd have seen that a couple of years ago, maybe, inspired by coming to work in the morning, coming to class in the morning, and seeing Kevin Witt flying his uh, uh, hot air balloon, and using this video that we just looked at today, is we know that we've made the case that the really the essence of this idea that you get buoyant flight is that the density of this fluid in here is less than the density outside it. And the reason for that is, as we said before, everything's in equilibrium if it's the same fluid in here as is out in a weightless container. But if you remove the fluid from here that is now less mass, in other words, less density, then W it reduces and there's a net force upwards. And so you can think of that as really just having to reduce the interior density of the system. And so you can think about that in four ways. You want to reduce the density of the interior fluid. <coughs> you can either um, increase the temperature, hot air balloon. You could reduce the molar mass of the fluid. You could use helium rather than air because it's a lighter gas than air. Or you could try and reduce the pressure. Reducing the pressure is almost impossible, as you know, right? If you had a lower pressure inside this thing than was on the outside, it's easy to have a balloon that's blown up that's a higher pressure on the inside. But if it's reducing it, it would just collapse. It'd be like sucking out of a juice box, which you probably haven't done for 12 years or something. I'm trying to guess your ages. Um, and so the options you have are to use helium, use a warm fluid, a warm gas, uh, and it could be a could be a liquid, right? You can have buoyant rising in the mantle. You could have a plume of liquid, warm water, rising in cold water because it's less dense. Same idea, right? So that's kind of the recap from, from uh, last time. Okay? So what we'll do today, uh, I guess we did this last time. That's exactly the derivation. This is where we ended up last time. One of you smart people, any questions I guess I should ask? One of you smart people wrote me an email saying, but in the example you did in class, even though they hadn't seen it in class, they didn't make it, they looked at it in last uh, year's uh, online stuff, you didn't take into account temperatures you go up to the top of Everest, which is really the key to what we're saying. So the other thing we could do if you wanted to is we could accommodate the fact that temperature does change as we go up in, in elevation. And so given right here on this right-hand side, is the a plot of what the temperature looks like as you go up in the atmosphere. So we sit here at something like 15 degrees centigrade at sea level. So standard uh, atmosphere and standard temperatures. And as you go up to something like the height that you fly in an airplane, something like 33,000 feet, which would be 10 kilometers, then the temperature reduces down to about minus, minus 60. And it's centigrade. So the difference over 10 kilometers is something like 75 degrees centigrade. So what we could do is when we take our relationship, which we said is our relationship is dp dz is equal to minus rho g, we can rewrite that as the change in pressure is equal to minus g times rho times dz, right? That's exactly what we did. Then we can certainly put in the ideal gas law here for pressure, which is, uh, or density rather. Density is equal to pressure divided by rt. But we can, instead of taking this as a constant, we could substitute this as a number that changes. And so that's all that's being done. This is in your book if you happen to look at it. By the way, when I mentioned maybe I said this last time, when I said you don't need the book, 
I mean you don't need it to do anything in this class in terms of assignments. You may choose to use it because it's actually a good book. It's chosen for a reason. But that's, that's your call. And so if in substituting this, so in other words, this, this is this relationship here. I'm not going to derive it. I'm just going to make the note of what we've done. This is this relationship we have here. All we're doing is that in this term that we put in the integral on the right-hand side, we don't take t as constant anymore. We take it as being a function of space. And the easiest way to do that is just realize that this is a straight-line relationship, and we could write an equation that represents that. And the equation that represents that is this. It says the temperature at any point is equal to the temperature at sea level minus some rate of change in temperature with height. Dimensional analysis, we know this is a temperature. We're adding a, this has to be a temperature. This has to be a temperature. The units of this are going to be uh, meters. And so the units of beta have to be in degrees C per meter, right, by definition. So that when you multiply these two together, you get degrees centigrade. So you're adding apples to apples. And so I think in our case, the, the change in temperature beta is going to be equal to 75 degrees C per 10 kilometers, which is the same as 0 0.0075, is that right? 1, 2, 3, 4, so centigrade per meter. And so if we use this beta and we substitute it into here, we do the integration, we get a complicated equation. Question. Yes? Isn't it Celsius from, from Kelvin because the exponent has the gas constant in it? Oh, I like, ah, yes, okay. Um, it could be in either, in this case, it's, it's important that we do temperatures in Kelvin, but this is a rate of change of temperature, and the rate of change will be the same. Great, great question. Yeah, yeah, we, we can use centigrade in this case. And if we do that, we end up with this expression. It's slightly different from the expression we had before, which is this. And actually, I did a little thing. I don't know how big this will come up on your screen. Did you know? No. This is just a little. Can you see this at all? You can't see that, can you? Um, You can probably see this, yes. So I can't change anything. So you can see some expression. The pressure where we don't accommodate temperature, the pressure change where we accommodate temperature, P1, atmospheric pressure at sea level, times expo exponential of G. You'll recognize this as the expression we had before. Um, temperature zero is 15 degrees centigrade at sea level, 288 Kelvin. Uh, gas constant, etc., gravitational acceleration. And this is the pressure where temperature matters. This is beta, 0 0.0075 degrees centigrade per meter, uh, and divided by the temperature at sea level. So we don't really need that. And if you run that, I guess we just did this, I think. If this gets larger. Oh, that's just a screenshot as well. So that's running that relationship. I guess I ran it in the background. So you see here that this, actually I put it, I could put it somewhere I can actually uh, scribble on. So if you run that little script, then you end up with uh, elevation. This is sea level. Zero meters. This is 8,000, this is 10,000 meters. This is pressure in Pascals. So this is 10 to the 5 Pascals, or 100 kilopascals. And this is 20 kPa. <clears throat> and if you look at the pressure that changes, uh, the blue one, which is where you, we, don't, we ignore the fact that Temperature is decreasing as we go up, and we include that effect in the red one. The difference is maybe 10% of the most, so not much difference, but there is a difference as you go up. 
What is interesting, I guess, is that the pressure that you feel at sea level versus being on the top of Everest, which is basically here, is about 40%. And so it's not surprising that you like to use oxygen there because you're getting only 40% of the oxygen that you could imagine that you'd get at sea level. And so that's the reason for that. And so, and actually, and the other thing we notice, uh, which is worthwhile drawing here, everywhere, this expression, dp dz equals minus gamma, is true. So in this case, this is dz. This is dp. And if we wanted to draw that in terms of this, oops, stop it. It's pens. Got a little activator on it. Don't. Okay, so in other words, pressure and unit weight correspond to each other. So this would be unit weight on the bottom if I could draw that, and this would be one on the, the vertical axis. And so it's saying that this is true absolutely everywhere at a point. So at this point, this is true. This is also true here, but they're different magnitudes because it's got a curve to it. And so it means that the unit weight here is larger, the unit weight here is smaller, density is larger, density is smaller. So that's basically a, uh, a vindication, hopefully, of what we're attempting to do. All right? Bless you. So let's hope my pen is working again. Um, we could use that, I suppose, to make the point that this is 10 to the 5. It's 100 kPa. See if it will work now. Now I've switched between it. This is 100 kPa, kilopascals which is atmospheric pressure. This is 100 kPa absolute pressure, absolute pressure, absolute temperature, but it is zero pressure gauge, gauge pressure. And so we need to make the distinction between those as we move between those, in the same way that we like to do that for um, temperatures. Okay. All right. What now? So we've made the point about this. This is an interesting thought exercise here, this little uh, figure on the right. How would we calculate the pressure that in a, a closed box that has an open portion at a point A and a point B, where this has a, a gas cap of some unknown pressure in here? We don't know what this pressure is, hence the question mark. What we can do is we can try and reference it always to a place where we know the pressure. And a place where we know the pressure would be this surface here, right? We know if we're sitting here swimming in this pool that we'd feel atmospheric pressure in the water here. If we went a differentially minuscule distance below that surface, at the surface, it would also be atmospheric pressure. So presumably we could calculate what the fluid pressure would be at point B just by doing P0 plus gamma H, where this is H. If we know that we can go from any point horizontally in the same fluid without changing elevation, and we'd be at the same point here, we know that PA is equal to PB. This has to be true. And then if we go up from here, we can just do the, 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 the difference, the, the, the opposite. We could do... P gas is equal to PA minus unit weight times H2. Right? And so we are going to use this relationship. This is going to be an important relationship for us because it says as we move anywhere within the same fluid, if we don't exit the fluid and we go by any path that we want to end up in that same place, same elevation, static fluid has to be the same pressure. And so that has some ramifications for us in other things, like, for instance, measuring changes in atmospheric pressure or measuring atmospheric pressure in itself. How do we know that the pressure that we exist at now is 101 or whatever it is kPa? Um, and so that is what you use maybe um, a barometer for. So let's see if we can do this. You'll love this one. It's beauty. <coughs>
800 millimeters long. And I've filled it with... We don't want to miss a minute. I'm going to this. make a barometer. And what I have here is a glass tube that's, look that's I'm about doing for 800 millimeters long. And I've filled it with mercury almost to the top. And I'm going to finish filling it so that I get filled all the way to the very top. And then I'm going to put my finger over the end and I'm going to invert it into the mercury. I'm going to set it here and use our clamp to hold it. Now, what's keeping this mercury column so high? It's that atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury, pushing this up. And let's see how tall our column is. 744 millimeters. It doesn't matter what size the diameter of our tube is, as long as it's relatively small. You can see this one's really small. I have another one that's almost twice the diameter of this one. But you can see that the level is the same in both tubes. What we're going to do is compare this crooked barometer to the barometer that we already have. And notice it rises to the same level. Excellent. Well, you don't need that. So, a barometer. Uh, where do we go? Aristotle famously said, nature fears Stop of empty space, when he claimed that a all right, so a barometer works on exactly the same principle that we've talked about. It relies on the, the facts that pressure changes with depth according to our rule of dp dz equals minus unit weight. And so based on that, we can calculate a change in pressure as we go down in a fluid. It also works on the principle that dp, the change in pressure as we go horizontally, is equal to zero. We've done this already, right? Uh, you may, well, certainly you'll remember. Remember we talked about a capillary tube. You take a capillary tube and you put it into a liquid and you get, if it's not mercury, if it's water, you get some kind of height rise. And the analysis we did for that was you basically took this tube and we cut it off at the base and we did a free body diagram with a weight acting downwards and a pressure acting upwards, which was zero, and surface tension pulling upwards, which was equal to, well, I'll pull it S, S acting upwards. And so the pressure acting upwards was zero because we know that atmospheric pressure acts here, atmospheric pressure acts here. We can go between B and B prime in the same fluid, it's connected, and we're at the same elevation. So by definition, this has to be atmospheric pressure at this point. If it's atmospheric pressure at this point, then we can then go up here by using this expression to calculate exactly what the fluid, the pressure is within this component here. And so if for some reason we were to know what the pressure was in this, we could calculate what atmospheric pressure was, basically. And it turns out if you use mercury, it has a really incredibly low vapor pressure, basically zero, uh, that we could choose this as zero. And if that's the case, you can, if we know that this is equal to zero absolute, we could calculate what the atmospheric pressure is. So and that's all that this little thing is doing. So we can calculate uh, by just going through this. What would we do? We'll use this way all the time. We'll take... PB or PB prime and we're going to add a height times a unit weight sorry a height times a unit weight of mercury HG and that's going to be equal to P vapor this by definition is atmospheric pressure we know we can measure this height. We know the unit weight of mercury, 13 times 
the density of uh, unit weight of water. And we know the vapor pressure of water is about zero. Not quite. There's a number here that's a very small number. It's in not in SI units, but you can work it out. It's a very small number. And so if we have this, we have everything we know to be able to calculate what the atmospheric pressure is, which is just this expression at the bottom. And atmospheric pressure would be exactly what was we've been using. It's equal to about uh, 10 meters of water, 34 meters of water, or I guess, as was just said, 0 0.744 meters of mercury. Right. Unit weight. And so we can use it in pressure. When we talk about atmospheric pressure in terms of uh, millimeters of mercury or inches of water, we're using it as a column height. And so the same reason is, uh, well, the same reason for this is why you can't pump water out of a well which is more than 34 feet deep. If you try and suck it from the top, then the pressure is large enough that it will just cavitate. There's too much weight on it. If it's only 28 feet, you'll be able to suck it in a straw if you have enough vacuum. If it's 34 feet, all of a sudden, the force you have to pull it up at the top of it to be able to suck it into your bucket has to be larger than the cavitation stress of, of, of strength of water, and it, it will cavitate. I have a question. Yeah. Um, for quizzes and exams, or exams, we have to Uh, you'd be given it if uh, you needed it. And so I think the reality, the question is that for exams, do you get given things you might need, like uh, constants? <coughs> the answer is probably yes, because if you don't give those, the graders have 10 different answers, and it's much, it's much more straightforward for you, and it's much more straightforward for, for them as well. Okay? All right, so we've talked about really all the principles that we need to talk about what's referred to as manometry. Manometry is the method of being able to calculate pressures within uh, pieces of equipment, uh, within the ground, fluid pressures in the ground, in oil reservoirs, in groundwater reservoirs. Uh, and there are a number of rules that we use. We've talked about the first ones, and that is that if we want to be able to calculate pressures at this point here, we have to reference it always to a place where we know. And typically, if we had, for instance, something like a standpipe piezometer, you could think of this as a well or a swimming pool for that matter. If you wanted to calculate the pressure PA in this particular case, we would just write an expression which allows us to write the pressure here as a function of the height of fluid multiplied by its unit weight. And so you know how to, to do that. Of course, it gets much more complicated than that uh, <coughs> because we can use these instruments, not just piezometers or wells as we've talked about in the top one here, but we can use manometers, YouTube manometers. And maybe what I'll talk about first is the kind of um, the rules before we use them. And so I'll mention them and then we'll use them. So two most important rules are one, when you go down in the fluid, you add the height times the unit weight because the pressure <laughs> increases as you go down. So if you're starting at a reference point here and going up, you subtract the opposite. So these are related to each other. So you need to remember those. It'll, this will become second nature. If you're working with, uh, don't worry about this one. In a closed vessel, if you have a gas in a closed vessel, you can usually assume that it's the vapor pressure that is acting. And that vapor pressure may be typically a low number, and it may be zero, depending on what we've talked about here. If you're measuring pressure in a gas, then we know that if you look at the pressure change with elevation within a, uh, a gas, we know that in a liquid, the pressure change with elevation changes with, what is it, 1 over unit weight. In a gas, it, vol it follows exactly the same relationship, but this curve is typically much steeper because the one and the unit weight, this unit weight of a gas and this unit weight of a liquid are probably a thousand times different from each other. 
So 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, 1 kilogram per cubic meter. And so you can imagine that this line here is basically vertical. And so number five merely relates to the fact that as you go through a gas, <clears throat> the changes in pressure over one meter are probably inconsequential if you have, in the rest of your system, a liquid. And so those are the two most important pressure uh, rules. If you go back to this little crib page we had at the beginning of today's class, which we didn't really talk about, you'll see these. If you go up, you subtract fluid pressure. If you go down, you add fluid pressure. Fluid pressures on a horizontal plane are equivalent. If a chamber is evacuated, then you use the vapor pressure. And the unit weight of a gas is essentially zero. And so we don't care usually if we go up and down in the gas. We take the pressure at the bottom of the gas, the same as the pressure at the top of the gas. So if you like, this line here are all five of those little rules in shorthand. Okay? So take them on. Well, let's use them. Let's use them. So how would we use it in, a, in an example? So this is done in a particular way. I think the way that this is laid out is probably not the most useful way of, of doing it. Uh, but let's do it in a different way. So what we could do is we're going to want to start at a place where we know where the pressure is, and we're going to want to end up at a place where we don't know the pressure. And what we could do is we could do it, we're probably better off starting from the place where we know the pressure. So we could start by doing this. P4 is here. We're going down. P4 plus H2 times the unit weight of fluid 2. So, okay, so this is a pipeline coming out of the page at you. This is a gas or a liquid in there, we don't know which. It has a unit weight gamma 1. This is maybe mercury or a different, this is a gas and this is a liquid. This has a different density attached to it, and it's used to be able to calculate what the fluid pressure is in this as a function of atmosphere. <coughs> this differential rise between here is an indicator, we'll find out, of the differences in the fluid pressures between P4, which is atmospheric, and PA, which we want to find out. So what we're doing is we're moving from P4. To get to this point, we add unit weight times H2, which is this. We're at this point here. We can go in this same fluid to get to this point exactly the same elevation, pressures have to be the same. We come up from here to get to this point here. We're going up minus H1 gamma 1, and that's equal to PA. We know that if this is atmospheric, that this is equal to, if we're doing it in gauge pressure, then this is zero, and this expression just ends up being PA is equal to these two terms. If, for example, this is a gas, is that convenient for us? If it's a gas, then it means gamma 1 is basically zero. <coughs> So, yeah, okay, so, sorry. so in other words, in this particular case, PA is equal to H2 times gamma 2, which is just equal to this height of fluid here. Okay? And that would be the, the pressure in gauge pressure relative to atmospheric. Um, it is going to be above atmospheric pressure, uh, so it's going to be 100 kPa, so the magnitude that we get here is on top of atmospheric pressure. If this was absolute, then all that would change would be that this number now would be equal to 101 kPa. This would be the same number. And this expression, I suppose, would be equal to PA 
is equal to h2 gamma 2 plus 101 kPa, which is what you'd expect, right? This is gauge pressure, and it's this number. In absolute pressure, it should be the same number plus a magnitude of the atmosphere sitting on top of us. Nothing more than that. Okay? And so I think so. So you can do it. It's done in this example a different way by writing it at different points, but it's by far the easiest thing is to work through. So you'll notice we did one thing. We wrote the first relationship was where we knew the pressure. P4 is where we knew the pressure, and we worked our way through the system. And that's usually the best way to, to be able to do this. Okay? Do you want to do another one? I mean, I think it's, uh, I'm trying to think what else. There's another example there. You can, ex almost exactly the same example. Uh, so perhaps we don't need to do that. A differential manometer uh, is you can use the same thing. A differential, so sometimes in experiments, if you want to do flow through experiments, say in porous media, Darcy's law, if you know what Darcy's law, says that the flow rate is conditioned by the change in pressure along the length of a core. You don't need to know the absolute pressures at upstream and downstream, but you know, need to know the change. You can measure the differential pressure much more accurately than you can measure a very big pressure at the upstream and a very big pressure minus a little bit at the downstream. So a differential manometer allows you to measure the differences in pressures. And you can do it exactly the same way here. If we wanted to solve this, we would do what? Uh, we'd decide which one we'd want to write, and we'd write PA. We're going down, and so it would be plus H1 gamma 1. The same fluid here to get to here, minus H2 gamma 2. And then it's minus H3 gamma 3. Bless you. Equals PB. So we don't know either PA or PB, but we could rearrange this expression in terms of P, actually quite easily, as PB minus PA, just by subtracting PA from both sides. And we have the differential pressure defined as a function of the unit weights and the heights that we measure quite accurately. If unit weight 1 and unit weight 3 were both gases, then we'd get rid of both of these, and we'd be left with this. And we'd know that the difference between these is equal to this magnitude. Exactly the same as before, that the difference in the elevation of this liquid has to be a liquid to separate two gases, right? <coughs> these could also be liquids in here, but this I guess it could be a gas, actually, so, uh, to do that. It wouldn't be very useful as a gas because it has to have unit weight to make, make the measurement, but it could, in theory, be that. All right? And maybe the last one that we'll make the point of is that we could do exactly the same with this differential manometer, but because if, for instance, the gas pressures between these two pipes were quite small, how big would H2 be? How big would H2 be if they're the same? Zero, right? And so in the limit, as the pressures get to be close to each other, sorry, don't just give you uh, epileptic uh, seizures, is that this depth would go to zero. And so if it's very small, what you could do is you could lay a pipe on its side so that it ex exaggerates the length that you want to measure. If this was vertically, it'd be a small amount. If it's horizontally, the height difference would be the same. It would be measured over a larger length of this uh, uh, tube. And so you can just represent this height here as a trigonometric relationship. And then you can substitute that into the, this is just h2, into the same expression. And if you do that, then if you measure L2 and you know what the inclination is, you have much more resolution with this length that you're measuring rather than trying to get this vertical difference between two pipes, the offset between two pipes, just by stretching it out. So that's the only reason for that. Um, and finally, uh, you know, we, you me we measure pressures all the time. There are a variety of ways of doing it. There are Bourdon gauges, which are very straightforward. Uh, the idea of a Bourdon gauge is just a, a tube 
which has a curve to it, like the, you know, one of the, the balloons that you see people making in the park. Uh, and when you change the fluid pressure, typically a gas pressure in the tube, it undistorts itself. And when it undistorts itself, you can calibrate that undistorting movement against a pressure change. And if you measure that amount, either as running a gear in a dial gauge, so it runs against the gear and dial gauge, and the dial gauge flips around as it gets powered by typically a gear at this location. As it flips around, it would make a, a change in the measurement of this gauge, or you can measure the absolute displacement of this and represent it. But much more commonly these days are that um, pressures are measured electronically because you can take it straight into a data acquisition system. Usually how pressure gauges work are one of two ways. They're either a pressure gauge where you have maybe a membrane. You change the fluid pressure that's acting on this membrane and this membrane displaces. You measure the displacement of that membrane and you calibrate that to a pressure change. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, two more seconds, is if you use a piezoelectric crystal. A piezoelectric crystal, you compress it with a change in pressure, it deforms, it makes a small electrical current, you measure that electrical current, and you calibrate that against fluid pressure. So that's it. So that's why we have to know something about fluid pressure.